Well, welcome everybody to Connect Group again, and trust you're all doing well. And uh, unpacking last week together, I'm sure you had some fantastic insights, and I hope good things that have come out of looking at humility together as a group, but also individually. We're going to be tracking over these next four or five uh, sessions together, just some of the, the values and the culture that we hold so dearly here at King's Church uh, uh, here in Aberdeen. And of course, the, the, the cultural values and the, the culture itself uh, are based upon truth that we find in the New Testament. And so we're going to go back into that first century church again today as we look at uh, uh, value number two, which is the value of generosity. And we're going to spend some time just seeing where the generosity fits in the context of that first century church, but also in the context of God's bigger picture about how we need to handle that which he's given it to us in the picture of stewardship. And then hopefully there'll be some practical application for us at the end, some things for us to, to challenge us and some behaviors that perhaps we'll be able to, to think about. And so today, as we look together again, we're back in that uh, early first century description of what the local church looked like. We know it doesn't contain all the detail, but within that picture, there are some immediate values that we can identify that are being expressed and, and, and delivered by the people there. And so let come with me as we read again and anchor ourselves back in Acts, two, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through to 47. Let me read it to you <clears throat> again today. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And then we have this wonderful statement at the end which wraps up the, the outcome of all this stuff. And it says in verse 47, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It doesn't take much for us to see and realize that something was going on within them. That actually there was a, a, a move of God's Holy Spirit within them and that it was being outworked in the way that they were behaving, in the way in which they were, they were living. That authenticity, that reality, that groundedness, but also that joy and that, that enthusiasm they had uh, for life. It starts by saying they devoted themselves and it's that picture that it didn't take anything else it was something that was going on within them that was causing them to choose, to find, as it were, purpose in, in what they were going to be doing and to find that they had to live life on purpose. And so there was something that was happening within them. But not only that, those few verses describe that that which was going on within them was making effect for something that was going on around them. And it, of course, describes that there are many great signs and wonders taking place. The supernatural was outworking from what was God was doing in their lives. That men and women around them were expressing favor. And, of course, God's hand of, of blessing was on them also, as many where lives were being totally changed. And so even in these five short verses, we can see there was a lot of what going on. What I mean by that is there's a lot of things happening. A lot of outcomes were taking place. A lot of experiences and situations were changing. But behind that what is a why. And it's the why that we want to look at today. Why was it that they behaved in the way they did? Why was it that their actions and their lifestyle and their choices were the way they, they were? And I guess that's what we're looking at in these few weeks because it's the values that we have that are shaped, the behaviors that we, we, we demonstrate are shaped by the values that we hold. And those values that we hold collectively come together in a culture that we celebrate. And can I say that again to you? The, the culture that we celebrate is marked by the values that we hold. And the values that we hold then are expressed in the behaviors, the choices, the priorities, the things we celebrate, the stuff we talk about, the way that we live. That's what the reality of, of the, the, having a, a deep-seated conviction and, and value is all about. And so we want to talk today about one of those values. And one of those values is the value of generous, generosity. Let me read some of the definitions about generosity. Generosity is that willingness to give help or support 
especially more than is usual or expected. You know, you, you and I know that generosity is about proactivity. It's about thoughtfulness and intentionality in giving and releasing and letting go that for which we have the power to either hold on to or indeed to send away. And so generosity is marked by, by our decision making and our determination and our priorities and our choices of what we do with what God has given to us. I guess it's more than just an action. It should be a mindset, it should be an attitude, it should be a lifestyle. But generosity is part of God's bigger picture. He has a bigger picture which is called stewardship in the New Testament. You see, God has invited you and I to be the stewards of everything he's given. The word for stewardship is a Greek word, it's oike nomenos. And from that we of course get economics, but it actually means house management or the management of the home. It's about the practice of systematic, proportionate giving of our time, of our talents, of our substance, of our finances, of our, our, our joy, of our, our celebration, of whatever it is that is living within us. Then generosity is the expression of stewardship, which is the ability to thoughtfully and intentionally make available for others that which God has put in our hands. A steward, you see, manages the property of his owner and he's responsible for the upkeep and the maintenance and the, the benefit of that which has been given to him. You and I know two things for sure, that God is the owner of all things. God is the owner of all things. Psalm 24 verse one and two says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Now, if we could even just grasp that truth today, that God is the owner of all things, then so much of our fears and our anxieties would go. It says that he is the provider of all things. He is the one who takes care of all things. He is the one who knows yesterday and today and tomorrow. If we could just get a, a grasp that God is the owner of all things, then actually it would settle our hearts. It would settle our concerns and fears about what's going to happen to me, what am I going to be doing, where am I going to be going, what's going to be provided for me. God is the owner of all things. But the second truth that we know about stewardship is that he's entrusted or he's allowed you and I to be the stewards of given things, of that which he's put in our hands. He doesn't demand it. He's, God's not obligated to, to, to give us anything and yet he puts into our hands that which he wants us to look after, that which he's entrusted to us, that which he's given for our health, our well-being, our strength, our, our life, I guess. And he's put that into our hands so that we might be the best we can be with that. You see, generosity is the outworking of what stewardship is about. Generosity is one expression, it's one behavior, it's one activity, it's one lifestyle, I guess, that demonstrates and, and shows what good stewardship is about. We've got many options in what we can do with what God has given to us. Number one, we can squander it. We can waste it on whatever we want to do and wherever we want to go. We can, we can take what he's given us and use it for crazy things. And crazy means you can use your time in any particular way. You can play games all day. You can shop all day with the time that he's allocated to you. You can put your finances all over the place. We can squander it. Number two, we can suspend it. And by that, I mean, we can hide it. We can, we can not let anybody know that God has put talent within us and gift within us and resource within us. We can just hide it and keep it to ourselves. Number three, we can obviously spend it. And by that, I mean, we can exchange it for something in return. You know that that's what money is. It's a means of exchange, really. The finances that you and I have, that we, we give that for goods or services and we get something in return. But that also happens with our time and with our encouragement. It can be spent in a way that brings something back to us. But number four is that we can send it. And by that, I mean that we can take what we've given and send it away. We can release it and give it away into the hands of somebody else, into the life of somebody else for them to benefit and for them to use it. And of course, finally, you and I can sow it for that which God has given to you and me, we can invest it in something else or in someone else that somewhere in the future, perhaps, there may be a return of that investment. So generosity is one expression, one uh, uh, outworking of the, the element of stewardship. 
But God invites you and me to live generously, not just to do generous acts, not to just have generous moments in our life, not to just have, have times in our seasons of generosity, but actually to live generously. He's looking for us for, to live a 24-7 generous life with the resources that he put in your hands and my hands. So what does that look like? Well, Proverbs 11, 24, 25 says these words, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. I love how Eugene Peterson paraphrased that in the message. He said, the world, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. It's a lovely expression and picture of a lifestyle of generosity, of what living generously means. If you and I choose today to live generously with our time, with our words, with our actions, with our friendships, with our finances, with our talents, then our world is going to increase in size. It's going to get larger and larger as God brings new people and new things into our lives. So what does a generous lifestyle look like? And what does generosity mean for us here at King's? Well, I think there are four increasing stages of generosity. Stage one is what I call responsive generosity. That's where you and I respond to a need that is presented to us. Where you and I give in, in, in as it were, in, in a reaction or in a response to that which is invited for us to do. When somebody says, could you give to? Could you help me with? Would you be able to? And we respond and say, yes, I can do that. That's responsive generosity, where we don't hold back, but we're able to say, yes, who I am and what I have, it's available for the need that you present. And of course, that's what was some of the story in the first century, where it says they gave and responded to the needs that were around them. That's responsive generosity. I guess it's where we place the tithe. It's that expectation that God places upon you and I that a tenth of our income will be given back to him. He allows us to keep 90% and use 90% for, for ourselves and for good things to steward well. But he says, I'm looking for the first fruits, for that first 10%. That's responsive generosity. If you tithe, then the Lord bless you. But it doesn't mean that you're expressing an, a, cra a crazy life of generosity. It just means that's a first stage of responsive generosity. Beyond that is what I would describe number two as expansive generosity, where actually what you're doing there is giving more than is expected. Giving out of your overflow, not just what is the transaction back and forth. Expansive generosity is when, when in response to the need, you give more than is expected in return. And I guess for these first century believers, certainly they were demonstrating expansive generosity as they sold their possessions. They don't, didn't just give out of what was in their pocket. They began releasing funds and releasing resources from what they had and selling that which they had and they were using to make available for those that were in a, a greater state of need. That's expansive generosity, where something happens in your mind that says, no, I, do, I don't need to just do a transaction here. I need to give more than over and above and greater than that which I'm, I'm currently doing. That's expansive generosity. Number three is initiative generosity. You know, I always love Ephesians 3.20, and we talk about it a lot in the life of the church. It's where we give glory to God, who is the exceeding abundant, the above what we ask or think or dream or imagine kind of God. And we know that. We know that he loved the world so much that he gave. He took the initiative in his generosity. He didn't wait for us to express our need. He already proactively did what he needed to do, did what more than he needed to do in providing his one and only son. And we celebrate that just recently at Easter, where Jesus gave his whole life for you and for me. If that wasn't an expression of initiative generosity, I don't know what is. But that captures the picture of what initiative generosity is. It's us taking the initiative and saying, you know what, I'm going to bless you. Though you haven't asked for it, though you haven't demanded it, though you haven't expressed a need for it, I want to bless you by giving you my time, by expressing my love for you, by expressing my encouragement of you, by giving my talents and putting them alongside you, by giving the time that I have and offering that to you. You haven't asked, but I will make myself available. The resources that you've put in my hand, Lord, 
then I'm going to make it available for somebody else. That's initiative generosity. But I think there's a fourth one, which I call inclusive generosity. Inclusive generosity is when it's your whole life that you're making available for somebody else's or something else's benefit. And again, in this first century group of disciples who are gathering together and within a bunch of them, God is doing something. Part of what he was doing, I believe, is this whole issue of inclusive generosity. Why do I say it? Well, it was beginning to be a lifestyle of good stewardship, a lifestyle of generosity. How do we know that? Well, it says not only did they sold, sell their possessions, but actually they sold their land and made their land available. You know, the land that people have is not only for today, the possessions that we utilize, it's for our tomorrows. It's saying, you know what, this is not just a today thing. I'm going to release that which is the investment for the future in the land that I have, in the return that I may get for that, in that which may come back to me in the future. I'm going to release that and give that away also. That was a lifestyle choice that said, you know what, it's not only for today that I'm going to do this action, but actually I'm putting myself at risk for my future. But I see that as a, as a, an, a wise investment. I see that as a good equation, that I'm going to be generous not only with my todays, but I'm going to be generous with my everydays. And that's the lifestyle choice of inclusive generosity, where it's our whole reality and whole self and everything that we are that we're saying, I want to just make that available. So those, I believe, are, are what generous lifestyle looks like. Those are the four increasing stages of generosity. And as we finish, there's just this intro for the conversation today. I just wanted to, to talk to you also about, so how does a generous lifestyle live like? How do generous people live? What are some of the attitudes that need to be taken on board? What are four decreasing self-focused stages of humility? Humility that we talked about last time. But what are the four stages of getting a, a removal of our self-focus so that we might be generous to others? Number one, I think, is evident in verses 44, 45. It's the submission to a bigger cause. It's the submission to a grander story. It's the submission to what God's plans were. You know, you see from these first century disciples that what was going on within them was an attitude, was an aspect, was a, an orientation towards submission. Not my will, but yours be done, God. That I'm going to follow with all of my life that which you want me to do. And submission starts when we say, it's not about what I want with my life, it's what you want, Lord. It's not about what I'm going to do with my resources, it's what you want, Lord. That's where submission begins. It's putting ourselves under a bigger story, a grander vision, a more nobler cause, and that's what God was presenting to these first century disciples, and he continues to present to you and me. It starts with submission. But it moves off, obviously, very practically to attention. And by that, I mean, when the disciples were aware, made aware of somebody else's needs, they were quick to respond. You see, when our attention is not on ourselves, and our attention is on somebody else, all of a sudden, somebody else's plight and challenges and difficulties become a great driver for our generosity. It, I guess, is one of the biggest antidotes for selfishness, that we put our attention elsewhere, that we put our attention on somebody else, that we put our attention on somebody else's challenges. And if we want to live a generous lifestyle, can I encourage you to talk in your group, how are you doing in this whole business of taking your attention off yourself and on to others. Number two is attention. But of course, it doesn't stop there because number three is participation. Many of us can see the needs that are around us, but somewhere in the journey, we find it difficult then to respond to those needs. The first century disciples expressed this value of generosity by their behavior. Their behavior was in that they participated in being the solution. They did release their finances. They did release their resources. They did intentionally think about what would we need to do to bring some benefit into somebody else's life? What would we need to not hold on to to make it of benefit for somebody else? And of course, that was their participation. And that's the challenge for us today and every day. If we're gonna live a generous lifestyle, when we get up in the morning, what choices are we gonna to make to say, okay, today 
I'm going to give away my encouragement to somebody else. Okay, today, I'm going to give away this portion of my time for somebody else's challenge. Okay, today, I'm going to give away that portion of what God has given to me financially that somebody else may benefit. Submission, attention, participation, but of course, finally, and as we close up today, we come full circle back to devotion. Devotion is that statement that says, it's my whole life that I'm giving away. It's the who I am that I'm making available for you, God. It's the what I have done in my experience, what God has put into my hands, everything that is available for us. We all know that we haven't been given equal opportunity, but we have been given equal responsibility. And that responsibility lands on how devoted are we. And Acts 42 begins, they devoted themselves. It's the ultimate expression of great stewardship and amazing generosity. Lord bless you today. Trust your conversation is as good and powerful as you talk together. Thank you.